Okay. Um, you should have had a little note-taking guy passed around here, and we're continuing. We're calling this summer the summer of love, and uh, we're, we're talking about different aspects of relationships and connections and uh, these kinds of things. And, and uh, what I want to talk to you about now is this little phrase here, biblical friendship can make me whole. Biblical friendship can make, make me whole. Sociologists tell us that there are two kinds of people in the world. People that bond and people who bridge. People who bond and people who bridge. In your notes, let's look at, get, get a little description here. It says, people who bond. People who bond, these are people who want to have a few good friends. They tr- trust often comes harder for these people. Once they establish a friendship, they want to protect it. When things go bad for them, they have a tendency to build walls. And so we have people that bond, and then we have people who bridge. People who bridge, these are people who make friends easily. They are more trusting. They've never uh, met a stranger. When things go bad for these people, they can tip into superficiality. And now the the thing I want you to get here when we look at these uh, these two different kinds, people who bond and people who bridge, is that it's not one is better than the other. All it's describing is two different kinds of people, two different people. The the fact is to to, uh, have a healthy approach toward life, you actually need both of these uh, kinds of people to be in uh, in your life and to be, and uh, to be a part of your life. So it's not it's not like oh we only want to be uh, you know like people who bond or we only want to be like people who bridge. Though, though, th- these are just two different kinds, two different approaches. Similar if we talked about like an optimist and a pessimist, right? In this room we would have optimist and pessimist. In your in your notes it says this. It's like the optimist and the pessimist. Neither is wrong, and both are necessary for a healthy world. They need each other to see reality. And then I put a couple little quotes down here. It says, an optimist stays up until midnight to see the new year in. A pessimist stays up to make sure the old year leaves. Okay, and then the optimist proclaims that we live in the best of all possible worlds, and the pessimist fears this is true. The nice part about being a pessimist is that you are constantly being either proven right or pleasantly surprised, right? (laughs) And then uh, last one here says, an optimist may see a light where there is none, but why must the pessimist always run to blow it out? So you have these two kinds of people. One's not better than the other, but they're both important. So let me, let, let's just talk about them again. And, and I want you to think now a little bit about yourself. Where do you fall in here? It says this. People that bond are people who have a tendency to have a few friends and really want to connect with those. Their tendency is to put up walls and protect what they have. People that bridge, on the other hand, are relational risk takers. They don't let walls stop them. They connect to people. They are reaching out all the time. They see the amazing opportunities around them all the time through relationships. People who bond see the world as more of a dangerous place. They see relationships as places of vulnerability where you can get hurt. They see, when, when a person that bonds sees a hitchhiker, they see a mass murderer. You know, this is, they honestly don't think that uh, when, when, when a person who bonds, when they're on an airplane, in their mind, the person next to them really doesn't want to talk, right? They, they, that person really doesn't want to talk. Now, the people who bridge, they see the world as a safe place. They feel the, the, the good in people. They see every relationship as a network gold mine. They see the hitchhiker as an eccentric billionaire like Howard Hughes who is looking for a worthy soul to leave their fortune to. Right? So there, well, one see, looks at the hitchhiker driving by and goes, this person is a bad person. The other one looks at him and says, who knows? This could be it. You know, this could be, you know, the person will love me. I pick them up and they'll, you know, leave me 100000 or something. You know, they honestly believe that the person next to them on a plane is sitting next to them trying to think up conversation starters. Right? The person is there. This person really wants to talk to me, but they can't. I'll help them out. I'll, you know, and give them, a, you know. So, so it, it, just... Looking at those descriptions I've just gave you, where do you see yourself? Are you a person who bonds uh, or are you a person who bridges? Where, where would you see yourself? Kind of maybe you may even want to make a note in your notes on how you would view yourself in most situations, you know. person who bonds or a person who bridges. As I've thought about this, 
I've realized that there is actually a third kind of person. There's the person that bonds. This is in your notes. The person that bridges and the person that is broken. Three kinds of people. The person that bonds, the person that bridges, and the person that is broken. A broken person is a person who has been so hurt in relationships that whether they started out as bonding or bridging, now they do neither one well. They don't, they're, they're, these people are hurting. A bonding person who has such incredible boundaries, for example, that no one can get near them. It's bonding gone overboard because of brokenness that's touched the person's life. Or the bridging person who is so superficial in relationships that no one really knows what's going on inside. See, they, it's, it's tipped from the healthy bonding and the healthy bridging into something that's, that's uh, beyond that. I understand how this can happen because I experienced tremendous pain in relationships uh, myself before I really had the emotional equipment to deal with it. My, I, you've heard me m- mention things about my youth before, but um, you know, I know now that my parents were very broken people. They were very hurting people. But uh, as a child, of course, they were all that I knew, I, uh, you know, just relating to them. You know, I think of the fact I attended six schools in four grades, that my mother shipped me to my father as a punishment for his not paying child support. He had to take care of me. I was put into a foster home where I was locked in a closet at night if they didn't like my behavior. And I had to hide because of the drunkenness of the parents that were in charge of the place. I can remember hugging my pillow at night for comfort, pretending it was my mother because I, I just had nobody that I was connecting with in that way. When I was in the fourth grade, I think I might have mentioned this even last week, I skipped school for three weeks, just wandered around. I failed the first grade, for, I failed the first four grades of school. One season of my life, I literally fought my way home from school every day. Every day, it was the same, you know, get up in the morning, go to school where I was a failure, and then had to fight my way home to get home with, uh, with other people. Um, I was given a personality test once, and it said that I saw the world as an antagonistic environment. When I you know, read the results, I thought, uh, duh, you know, it, it has been pretty antagonistic, you know, I don't know what world you've been in, but this world's been, been, been tough, and, uh, you know, my, it, the, the, the test said my greatest fear was that someone would take advantage of me in some way. My motto could have been, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people really aren't out to get you, you know, it could be happening, and this reflects the brokenness from my past, uh, and, and uh, you know, I needed healing. I needed, and, you know, if you have brokenness like this, apart from the mercy of God and the work of God, you become not a bonding person or a bridging person, but you become a broken, broken person. And uh, in your notes, I put down this line. I said, I need the healing of God not to be totally distorted by the hurts from my past. You know, maybe you were abused as a child. Maybe you were crushed by divorce as an adult. Maybe you were bullied in the classroom. Maybe you were neglected by a career-possessed parent. Stabbed in the back in your first big romance. Or went to a church to be involved in, in ministry but were, you know, were hurt there. You know, sometimes churches can be hard places. Tough things can happen. Some, you know, sometimes people, even when they're trying to do nice things, they, because they have misunderstandings and they don't understand things right, they can do really hurtful things in the name of trying to be nice. I actually had people who have come to me, you know, when I was leading the church, they didn't like the way I was leading it, uh, felt certain decisions I was making were incorrect, and, and basically come to me and prophesying that God was going to kill me, basically, take me out of the way. Now, the thing that made this really painful was I knew these people, they were friends, they really liked me, and I knew they were doing what they thought was right. They were really trying to do what they thought was right. It wasn't like they were crazy people. They were nice people. And, uh, but, they, but they just were totally, they had just gotten things that just gotten totally distorted. And so you have these kinds of hurts, and, and if you don't respond rightly, if you don't understand the nature of this kind of stuff, you can move from being a person that bonds or a person that bridges to being a very broken person. 
person with way too many walls or way too much superficiality and just hurting in a lot of ways. One of the ways I've, uh, you know, come to understand that that has to be there for, for me is this, um, is, is an understanding basically that, that I, that uh, friendships are critical and important, but the first thing that brings healing to your life is your relationship with Christ and your connection with him. If you thought about life, you know, your life like a circle, that's not too good. Let's try this one. If you, th- if you th- saw about your relationship with life as a circle, all of us have like a, a chunk that's been chewed out of the circle. That is something, something has happened. At some point in our lives, sometimes it's in our childhood, sometimes it's from good people who do bad things, sometimes it's, it, it can be all kinds of different situations, cruel people that somehow have touched our lives or hurt us in some way. And we end up with a, with like a missing piece in our life. And unless this area gets filled, you know, the Bible says, not the Bible says, science tells us, nature abhors a vacuum. And and so there's, there's this thing that says this area has got to be filled, this thing that has been eaten. And so we, we want to do it. So, you know, like maybe in my situation, I could have said, you know, the the, uh, maybe it was insecurity. You know, I talked to you about seeing the world as an antagonistic place where things are coming against you and things are trying to hurt you and, and this kind of stuff. So maybe it might have been, been the, that, in, that, that, uh, that, that sense that the world is dangerous, you know, kind of a thing. That thing has been, this, my sense of safety and security got knocked out. Now what happens is all through your life, you feel this inside of yourself and so you try and fill your space. It's different for different people. Some people, it's maybe your family was so fractured that, you know, you have a tremendous sense that maybe you weren't really wanted, weren't really loved. And so there's this hole inside of you that basically I need to be loved. Some of us, because of, of uh, certain either circumstances or sin or something, our families were affected in such a way that maybe we lost a father early on or a mother early on. And so there's like this, this hole inside of our lives. And so there's this natural tendency to fill this. You want to fill this. So, you know, if my thing was security, let's say, for example, then I might say, you know what, if I put money in here, then I'm going to, you know, this is all going to be filled up. And so I make the pursuit because money can buy me security. You know, money can give me a house where nobody can hurt me. Money makes it so people want to be around me and, and connect with me. And, and this money is like super value. And so money becomes like this driving force in my life. And when I, when I fill my life with money, I actually get, or I think I'm filling it, I actually get a, um, a temporary sense of security that comes inside of me. And I say, okay, now I've done it. You know, now I've, I've, I've given myself, what, you know what. But of course, you know, there comes a time, maybe it's a phone call from the doctor saying I've got cancer. Maybe it's uh, a broken family relationship. So here I have all the money in the world, but my wife wants to leave me. Or, so, and all at once, maybe it's my children, you know, I, I, I've built all kinds of money, but I lost my relationship. And all, all at once, what happens is I realize money is not it. And then I find myself all broken down. Everything is all broken down again. I had a temporary, a temporary thing here, but, it's, but I'm all broken down again, you know. Maybe the thing, you know, I have inside of here is this, you know, like I talked about the love issue, you know, so I, I don't feel, I don't feel loved. And so, you know, I, I, uh, I create, you know, all kinds of, of, uh, of stuff. And, you know, maybe I get married and I say, well, you know, my wife, you know, she loves me. My wife loves me. She loves me in every situation. She's not like these other people who have been in my life who really didn't love me that much. You know, she loves me in every situation. And, and so as long as I have my wife and I have my family, I'm loved. I'm a loved person. And, and I feel whole again. I feel with my wife and my family, I'm, I'm whole again. But then, of course, as life goes on, because people you know, go through their struggles. Maybe my wife goes through a struggle. Maybe she's got a health issue that happens. Maybe in our relationship, there's some tension that takes place because I'm broken anyway. 
and they have problems and stuff. And so what happens, I realize, well, what about, you know, my wife, maybe my wife doesn't love me. And all at once, my life just feels like everything is just caving in because, because this, this emptiness that's there inside of me, you know, in this situation, all at once, the whole in my life is so manifest again. And so how do we fill this, this hole in our life? And, uh, you know, what, what happens? So we have to have something that we can rely on and connect with. Uh, you know, uh, I think one of the last sessions of school this year, I talked on the faithfulness of God, right? We have to have something that's absolutely enduring and connecting in this way. And, of course, that's Jesus, right? Jesus. Okay, now here's the, here's the deal. We used to sing a, a hymn. Jesus Christ is made to me all I need, all I need. And um, this actually helped me understand more about my devotional life and other things like this. Because in my mind, I say to myself, well, if I really experience God, why don't I experience a miracle? Because to me, a miracle would be God takes the piece that's missing, replaces it, and now I'm a whole person, right? I'm just a whole person. But you know what? You never become a whole person like that. You know, that's not where your healing is. The wholeness that you experience is the wholeness of reliance on and connection with Jesus Christ. So as long as I'm connected to Jesus, as long as I'm linking with Jesus, you interact with me and you don't see, you know, as a matter of fact, instead of me being the person who was abandoned by his family, many people see me as an example of fatherhood. The person who never had a father has actually become, in many people's eyes and minds, the, the actual illustration of a father. Are you with me? You follow what I'm saying? It's a miracle, right? It's a miracle, right? But, but if, I, if I lose my connection with Jesus, that would disappear. And the harshness and the, the insecurity and the fear and all that other kind of stuff would just manifest itself again because the fact, the fact that my family did the things they did and the fact that I experienced the hurts, that doesn't go, that's a part of me. That's just who I, that's a part of who I am. The thing that makes me whole is Jesus. See, th- this put a whole new um, understanding for me because when I, like when I first came to Bible school and stuff like that, and they would talk about us spending time in prayer and spending time in the Word, and I used to think to myself, what well, you know, I mean, it's a book. How many times can you read it? You know, it's, it's just going to be boring, right? And I, I, I didn't understand exactly what was going on. But then I came to realize something. The reason these things are so important is because it sustains my relationship with the Lord, and it makes me whole. You with me? It, it's what keeps me whole. So you think you're going to be whole like you're going to be healed, like, like uh, I'm not going to need anything anymore. No, you never get over needing Jesus. And your wholeness that, that you experience is the wholeness that comes to you because of your reliance and your relationship and your trust. And so now I'm not afraid of not being loved anymore. Instead, I can actually be a lover. I don't have to worry about everybody loving me. I can care for others. Why? Because, because of Jesus in my life and the, and the sense of wholeness and acceptance and connection. I don't have to worry about being fearful and insecure. Why? Because of the sense of... Now, if, I, if things break down for me, Right? If I, my relationship with the Lord isn't kept, if things break down for me, then all at once you see all that stuff coming back up in my life. All at once you go, whoa, this guy, what's his problem? He's so insecure. Whoa, this guy, what's his problem? He's so fearful. Whoa, this guy, you know, he's, he's looking out to always build walls, you know, of separation and guarding and all that. What's going on there? Why is that happening, right? See, that, that would happen if I don't maintain that connection, connection, that relationship with Jesus. So first is our relationship with Jesus, but then with that, what does God use? And God often uses friendships and connections. We've, we've talked before about the, you know, the idea of the, 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 the transformation triangle, right? How does the Lord change us, right? He, he, first of all, he uses the word of God, or, um, uh, 
you know, and then there's uh, relationships, and then there's trials, you know. So we have the, the truth of God's word, we've got the truth here, and then we have relationships, and then we have trials, and then, of course, the Holy Spirit is using all these things, and that's how we experience transformation. And so we have to have these relationships we have to have this connection because that's part of the way God works in us and, and we experience transformation in that way. Okay, so uh, in your notes it says this. Biblical friendship is the healing me- medicine many of us need to become relationally whole. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like really important for us to have this in our lives. Now, number one in your notes. To recover from brokenness. Why do you need this? this okay. To, be, to recover from brokenness, you need unconditional love. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. It's only in an atmosphere of absolute security that healing can be birthed. And that's why the love of Christ is so transforming for us, because we, when, we finally, when it finally dawns on us that we don't have to perform that God's not looking uh, down and going, you know, that, that, that he loved us. You know, while we were yet sinners, he loved us. It was never based on our performance, on who we were. When that thing finally penetrates your soul at the deepest level, and I'm telling you what, it takes to, for God to drive that down into your soul. It's not, like a, it's not like an instant thing. It's a lifetime thing because there's this natural tendency inside of us to always gravitate toward the, the pain, you know, toward the, toward, the, toward the hurt. And so God, has, there's this thing inside of us that always says, you know, I've got to perform. I've got to be good. I've got to prove I'm worthy. I've got to show the, 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 this drive inside of us. But as long as that drive dominates, you can never really get healed from your brokenness. The thing that sets the stage for healing is when you finally come to the place that you know, you realize that this thing doesn't have to do anything with me being good or being better or being the, performing well. Or, and it has to do with me trusting what Christ has done for me and resting in, in that. And when that rest comes to your soul, all at once there's a place there where the Lord can begin to work and heal and do things inside of you. Um, you know, th- this is why m- marriage is meant to not have divorce. Uh, you know, when... You see, as long as, as I'm in a marriage where divorce is a possibility, I'm performing. Because I have to keep you happy. Because otherwise that thing is going to, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose this relationship. I've got to keep you satisfied. And so I'm constantly performing in the relationship. But when I come to a place where my wife and I have you know, like my wife and I did, you know, we said, we said, divorce is not a possibility. A lifetime of misery, yes, that's a possibility. But, but divorce is not a possibility. Once we got that, so we really believed that, it created an atmosphere where things could, real healing could take place. Things could happen inside. Because we knew, no matter what happens, we're not leaving each other. We're going to hang in there. We're going we're gonna to do it. Now, my life has been touched by divorce in my family, and uh, many of the people I love and care about have been touched, and, and there's, I don't, I'm not in any way um, trying to disparage or hurt people move through these areas. But this is why God's, in God's original design, he was trying to create this atmosphere, because this, it's in this atmosphere that, that, that truth and relationships and trials can work together to, to help make this happen, this, this, this thing uh, go in that way. Um, okay, let's go jump to the next one here. To recover from brokenness, you need honest feedback. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. Now, who is going to tell you that you're coming on too strong? Who's going to tell you that you're being too passive. You want to know why? Because with brokenness, there comes a, we inherit something. And, and when we have experienced brokenness, we always inherit blind, blindness. It's a part of what happens to us when we move out of the healthy bonding and bridging to a place of brokenness in our lives. We always inherit blindness. 
And what does that mean when I say we inherit blindness? We cannot see clearly. And unless you have people in your life that you believe in, who you are willing to give them some open space in, in your life, you know, you have to have a way for God to get to you that is outside of your own, um, just your own uh, perception. Because you always inherit blindness with your brokenness, see? And so if you say to myself, well, the Lord is just going to have to tell me that first before I'll do anything, you know, that kind of, if you take that kind of mentality, God has no way to get to you if you're in an area of your blindness, right? And so you need a couple people in your life. I'm not saying, you know, those of us who are bonders, you know, we, you're not going to open this up to everybody. But you need a couple people in your life who have the ability to speak to you honestly, and you're going to listen to them even if you don't understand what they're saying or why they're saying what they're saying. You've got to have a couple people like that. My wife, you know, my, if my wife tells me, I think, you know, I come up with an idea, I want to do it, and she tells me, uh, I don't feel good about that, or I'm concerned about this side of it, and stuff like that. I've got to put the brakes on. I've got to slow down. I've got to find out, okay, she is hesitating. Here's a person who cares about me, who loves me, who wants the best for me. Maybe there's something that needs to be modified. Something needs to be adjusted. Something needs to happen. Uh, Paul Johansson's a person in my life that, you know, if he told me, Mike, I want you to stop such and such, or I want you to do this or do that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even have to, uh, I, I would just say, okay, that's it. I, I'm going to stop. Now, I may not agree with him, and I, I, and, and I, I think of a recent situation. Where I didn't necessarily agree, but in my perspective, I said, I said, you know what? I have to give God somebody he can talk to in my life that I will listen if I agree or don't agree or whatever, right? So who, you know, who is there in your life? You've got to have a friend like that that can speak to you and give you feedback and help you navigate your personal blind spots. You know, who's going to tell you that guy is not right for you? You know, you're pursuing the relationship and, you know, maybe he's the first person. Who's going to say to you, you know what, this is not right? Who's going to say to you, hey, you know what, that woman is coming on a little strong to you. I don't understand why you're not distancing yourself in that situation. If your child rearing is screwed up, who's going to tell you, you know what, uh, you know, the way you're dealing with your kids just seems a little odd to me. Right? What's, what's happening? I, what Terry and I had to have that happen with us, with our, our you know, Toby, our first, our first son. He was like absolutely a wild man. I mean, he, he was walking by the time he was nine months old, you know, and, and he, was, he had no brains but would go everywhere. And we, both of us came from divorced homes. Both of us basically were, Terry was an actual only child. I was raised pretty much as an only child in a, in a single mother situation. And, and, uh, and, you know, we just did not have a clue. Um, you know, people would come, they'd say, uh, They'd say, uh, what a cute little boy. Why, why, is, why, do you, why is he tied up with a leash like that? You know what I mean? It's, we had to tie him with a leash because we didn't know where he was going to go. We didn't know how to control him. We didn't know what to do. And, and, uh, and Joe Nettleton, I remember Joe Nettleton sitting me down and telling me, saying, Mike, something is wrong. Things are, things are not right here. That's what happened. And you, you know how much I wanted to hear that? Not too much, right? Somebody tells you you're not doing a good job as a parent. You know, you don't want to hear that. But if you don't have somebody that can say that, who can tell you that you're being too sarcastic with your wife? Or that you're speaking to your children in such a way that it's stealing away their, their sense of self and their, their, their sense that they can do? Who tells you that kind of stuff? Who can say to you, you know what? Your dress is a little immodest. It just You're projecting a certain vibe. I don't think you realize what's happening. Who, ha who has the ability to talk to you? I'm not saying you've got to listen to every person out there, but who has the ability to talk to you? to say that. If you don't have some room for that in your life, you're going to be in, uh, you know, you're not getting the, the benefits of the healing power of friendship. Okay, another thing we need to recover from brokenness. To recover from brokenness, you need to be exhorted. And this is another thing that a friend does for you. Iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens, sharpens another. Exhortation. This is what it means to be exhorted. It means to stretch challenge and provoke another person. To stretch, challenge, and provoke another person. Derek Levandusky sent me a note one time. He said, in his note, he said, Pastor Mike, as you were sharing, I realized how often you have encouraged me and brought me higher in different areas of my life. 
I was thinking that one of the ways you impact people is that you bring out the better part of people. And I understood what he was trying to talk about because I've marveled myself because what Derek was talking about is a gift that God's given. And, and this is a gift just like, you know, a person gets a gift of leadership or a, a gift of prophecy or that kind of stuff. I have a spiritual gift, and it's the gift of exhortation. And over the years, I've had many conversations with people where the direction of their whole life is changed in just a few words of interaction with them. I mean, a matter of fact, sometimes it makes me afraid to talk in certain situations. Because, because somehow that gift, I realize that gift is there. And, uh, I mean, I have people who, the, you know, everything is, you know, they've gone to Bible school, they've gone into ministry, they've gone to the mission field, they've risen to some challenge in their life. And, uh, and you need, in your life, you need people who, who, who can exhort you. You know, exhortation breaks you loose when you get stuck. And many of us get stuck. We get caught in a rut. You know, somebody said a, a rut is a grave with the ends knocked off. And we get caught in a, in a rut. And we're in that rut, and we don't know how to get out ourselves. We don't know how to, but you'd, you know, you would be amazed at the spiritual gift in one of these things. How do we get transformed, right? The truth, relationships, trials, working together, the Holy Spirit, we experience transformation. One of the things that can be so powerful is when a friend speaks to you in exhortation and something, all at once, you get unstuck. It's like you, you're bumped out of the rut. You, every, things that were at one point where it seemed like nothing was possible, all at once everything becomes possible for you because you've been lifted out of this thing you were stuck in, this way of thinking. So this is the way friendship, this is, you know, friendship can, can, can heal us. You know, it, it has that, that power. It can make me whole. And, uh, and so th- this is why we want to take advantage of it and draw upon it. Let's just bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord right now. Could we do that? And People that bond, people that bridge, and people who have been broken. They've been hurt. And as a result of that hurt, their bridging has been transformed into superficiality. Their bonding has been transformed into wall building. And the Lord is speaking to you and he's saying, I am your healing, but I move through friends, biblical friends, who can bring, help bring wholeness into your situation and into your life. If you're here today and you just... You just acknowledge, you know what, I, I can feel I've tipped over into brokenness in some ways, and, and uh, I, I haven't had the friendships, or I haven't made room for the friendships that God wants to bring in my life to help me find healing. Maybe you're here and you're just realizing, you know what, I realize I've substituted some other things for Jesus in my, my situation to try and bring me some peace, some some security, some comfort. And I'm realizing that I've got to connect with him and I have to connect with others. And if you feel that, you feel like the Lord's touched on something in your heart, just lift both your hands in the air right now. And I just want to pray for you. Lord, just around the room right now, our hands are lifted and there's this, there's just this sense of we, we need, Lord. We need, And I just ask you right now to come. First, that you would help us clear out the broken area of all the false gods that we've put in there. 
that we thought could bring us comfort and safety and protection, all the things that we thought, well, okay, this will make, make me feel better and make me feel whole. And, and this, Lord, we just clear them all out right now to make room for you, Lord. We realize that you are our source. You are our security. You are always faithful. You will never fail, Lord. You are the one who makes us whole. You are our healing. It's not that we get healed. It's that in relationship with you, we are healed. That is, that you are our healing. Apart from you, there is no healing. You are our healing, Lord. And so we just, we just call upon you right now. We ask you to help us to repent and purge these things. And then, Lord, we also ask that you'll help us to find faithful friends. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, you say to us, Lord. And to find faithful friends who will be able to stand with us and help us become the people that you've called us to be. We thank you for it, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this summer. We thank you for the opportunities that you're giving us here for connecting with people. We thank you for, for all the trials, all the truth, and all the relationships that you use to transform us. We trust you, Lord. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys.